you very much. Um, I'm sorry that uh, we can't all be together in Paris, but uh, it's a delight to be here. All right, so I'm going to begin, and the uh, staff will advance my slides. I'll tell you when, but we'll start with the outline. So when cab drivers start bragging to me about their investment prowess, I usually conclude that trouble is coming. And the fact that Bitcoin is more valuable than all the other cryptocurrencies combined and that a recent paper by um, Makarova and Shore estimate that 90% of Bitcoin trading appears to be unconnected to meaningful economic activity, that makes me worry that we're reaching another period of mania in financial markets. Uh, to many who are investing, I'm sure they think of cryptocurrencies as a disruptive innovation that represents the future. Predicting the future is, is dangerous, but today I want to share my views on when we should expect financial innovation to be transformative and disruptive and when it's likely to be irrelevant. And I'm going to argue that this distinction involves answering two key questions. What explains the market structure that currently exists? And what is the value proposition associated with the new innovation? And is it likely to be enough to upend the status quo? I'll suggest that there are broadly three economic forces that can be responsible for existing arrangements. And evaluating disruption possibilities depends on which force is present, because some are much easier to overturn than others. Put differently, just because the current arrangements look cumbersome or expensive, it does not necessarily follow that a better alternative will succeed at overturning the status quo. I'll try to convince you of the usefulness of this framework by using it to explain some of what we see in the current financial landscape. And then I'll turn to a few areas of the current financial system where I think disruption is likely to happen. And I'll close with a few observations on cryptocurrencies and what my observations might mean for the risk to financial stability. Um, and I should add that I'm not speaking today in my capacity as a member of the Bank of England Financial Policy Committee. Uh, I'm here just on my own. All right, so please uh, advance to the next slide. Okay, so having spent 30 years on the faculty at the University of Chicago, you'll not be surprised to find that I hear uh, that I start with the premise that markets tend to work pretty well. Now, to be sure, we know conditions when they do not, and much of the most important current research in finance focuses on these conditions and seeks to understand the implications for particular circumstances. So my starting point today is to think about when do we expect the financial system to settle on arrangements that appear from the outside to be vulnerable to disruption. As I've already said, I believe that requires two conditions. First, the status quo must offer profits for whoever innovates to, to try to change the existing arrangements. And second, the innovation must not merely assume away all the constraints that exist within the current system. In some cases, the whole point of the innovation, of course, is to overcome a weakness of the existing system that looks like a constraint, but that's not always the value proposition of new approaches. Maybe an example will help make this more concrete. Cross-border payments are notoriously expensive and fees tend to be high. This might make it seem like anyone who can come up with a low-cost way to transfer money will inevitably be able to disrupt this market. One reason, though, that fees are high is regulation. It's completely appropriate for the official sector to worry about the people, uh, the ability of people to move money across borders in ways that are untraceable. The financing of terrorism or other illegal activities is a real threat, and we want to be able to make sure that the authorities can track transfers. This creates the need to build in monitoring procedures that must be reliable and must be maintained. Offering a service that cuts costs by eliminating tracking would be cheaper, but it would have no chance of actually succeeding. A truly disruptive innovation must not only be cheaper, but it must operate in a way that does not give criminals a free pass. Now, stepping back from this, this particular example, regulation is in fact a general factor that can raise costs and therefore prices, that might make some services or products appear to be ripe for undercutting. And in some cases, like in my example, the regulation is clearly in the public interest and an, entr an entrant that sought to avoid the regulation would be irresponsible. In other cases, however, the cost of complying with the regulation can be so high that it actually deters entry. And indeed, there are times when incumbent firms favor complicated regulation precisely to keep out new competitors. Minimizing this kind of regulation is desirable, 
And there are times when new firms can call attention to areas where this is happening. Now, a second force that can lead to high prices, um, go ahead and go to the next slide, please. Uh, a second force that can lead to high prices are uh, the presence of what economists would call fixed costs. These can take many forms. For example, licensing rules often vary across jurisdictions, and this can be true inside a country, for example, across states in the US or across countries. To, to achieve scale, entering each new market involves incurring a new set of expenses. And when the rules differ across areas, that makes it more expensive to operate and larger firms will tend to have an advantage in dealing with this. Compliance costs also take this form. There's simply a large amount of overhead that's necessary to follow the rule. So you've got regulation, you've got fixed costs, and then the fixed costs become even more important when they interact with the third uh, force that can shape market structure, and that's the presence of network effects. Network effects are ubiquitous in financial services. Credit cards are much more valuable when many businesses take them, and exchange is much more attractive when many people do business there. And back in the day, a bank that had more branches and automatic teller machines was more attractive. So I'm going to focus on these forces. And before moving on, I would say these same three factors would be relevant for thinking about market structure in almost all industries. Financial services are heavily regulated, so the relative importance of that factor is probably higher than other industries. So I'm not trying to suggest what I'm saying today is necessarily unique to finance, but it still works. Next slide, please. Now, by looking at regulation, fixed costs, and network effects, we can understand a lot about the current structure of the financial system. So let me give you a few examples. Credit card lending is extremely profitable. For instance, you know, last year, despite the pandemic, credit card revenue uh, companies reported revenue of $176 billion. Yet MasterCard and Visa continue to dominate this industry. Obviously, network effects explain why they've been able to withstand the many attempts to, to enter their business so far. For most consumers or firms, one only needs a couple of credit cards. The value of the card depends critically on the ability to use it. Offering people a much lower cost card that's accepted at many fewer merchants would be in a, unappealing to many customers. And historically, there have been non-trivial costs to recruiting new merchants. Cross-border payments uh, would be another example of a very expensive service. Costs several percent of the amount being transferred. The World Bank estimates about 700 billion each year is sent by people uh, residing outside of their native country back home in the form of remittances. So this is a large market and one important requirement is to offer uh, the, to operate is the ability of the service provider to trace the transactions and co comply with the money laundering rules as I already described. The fixed cost of complying with the various local regulations would also need to be addressed. And one of the biggest advantages that the incumbents have is brand recognition and the fact that most people are, are cautious about who they will trust with their money. Okay, so that's a second example. Let me turn to a third one that maybe is less familiar. But buying a house, as, as you probably realize, involves mountains of paperwork. And I think most people, the first time they try to buy a house, certainly in the United States, are shocked to learn that you need to buy title insurance to make sure that, in fact, you have a good claim on your property. The mere fact that it requires expertise to figure out if there is a lien on a property and that this is not something that can be reliably looked up on the internet is also kind of surprising. The process for varying this, uh, verifying this information differs from location to location. So to take a particularly uh, egregious example, in the state of Ohio, there are 88 different offices that are in charge of issuing titles. And even when the, st the status of the title is clarified, there are multiple parties involved in a sale. There's a realtor, there's a lender, there's a title company, and an owner. And all of them need to be updated on the status of the transaction. So there's a lot of effort that goes into collecting all the various approvals and then passing them back and forth so that all the parties are on the same page. The fixed costs of operating in this market uh, and to navigate this ma maze are, are large. Okay, so now let me go to the next uh, slide. 
This framework can also be used to understand why some innovations have happened. As I mentioned, the presence of physical branches was once an essential component of growing market share in banking. With the rise of the internet and electronic banking, uh, this is no longer necessary. Many people can now conduct their banking without ever having to enter a branch. All you need is a smartphone or a computer. The telecommunications revolution made it possible also to link various ATM networks so that most cards work at all locations. Put differently, these technological advances remove the fixed cost of having physical branches and also change the kind of network arrangements that were possible. Now, another uh, area that's been fundamentally transformed is the way domestic payments are made. Not long ago, payment systems were what economists would call vertically, vertically integrated. The entire infrastructure that was uh, involved in a payment was housed inside one organization. Figure one reproduces a, a, a stylized example from the Bank of England's financial stability report that shows how the payment system looks now. And we'll see in a little bit how it's regulated. Technological advances have made it efficient to break up the, the chain that used to reside in one place and put it into a bunch of small steps. And new entrants have substantially lowered the cost of these various steps and made it much cheaper to make payments. Okay, now let's uh, go to the next slide uh, and, and think now about what I would call impending disruption possibilities. So a more ambitious and speculative application of this framework is to try to use it to anticipate where further disruption might be likely. And I'm going to focus on three areas where change is already underway and quite possibly transformative. So the first, again, is cross-border payments. Here, there's already firms such as Ripple that are operating to serve business-to-business -business payments. Ripple does business with central banks around the world and complies with money laundering rules. It can process more transactions per second than banks can, and it charges fees that are tiny for its services. Part of the way it makes money is by settling the transaction in its own digital asset, XRP. So it earns profits from releasing this asset into the system. And it seems to me over time, more and more business will flow through these kinds of providers rather than just traditional banks. Now, I don't want to suggest that XRP as an asset is riskless or it's going to become the model that other challengers will adopt. I'm just noting that the jump to a new model May, may be a big advantage for the disruptors. A second area where, where I think uh, this is underway is small business lending. It's notoriously difficult for traditional banks to determine the credit worthiness of small business. It's expensive to enforce covenants, and these kinds of firms are vulnerable to lots of shocks that larger firms would just shrug off. Yet there's considerable demand for credit from these firms. For instance, the US Small Business Administration estimates that in 2019, there was an aggregate more than $170 billion of loans that were individually each less than $100,000. So in the language of the framework, the fixed costs of monitoring these kind of customers is going to be very high. With the rise of new fintech payment services, such as Square or Stripe, there's a revolution under the, underway in the provision of business credit. Fintech lenders see all the revenue that's coming and going into a business. Based on purely monitoring that cash flow, which they have to do in order to provide their service, they can lend it at relatively low cost. And as these firms expand their networks to serve more and more businesses, this kind of lending is destined to grow. This, this lending is exploding, and one can imagine a huge fraction of the market will eventually migrate to these platforms. In fact, there's a lot of research shown uh, over the last few months that when the U.S. tried to implement its payment protection program, that the fintech lenders were, were more nimble at getting those loans out than were some of the traditional banks. Now, a third lesson, a uh, third business that seems ripe for disruption is property title insurance. Uh, I, I would hope eventually someone will manage to digitize all the property records everywhere so the searches can be automated. But in the meantime, go back to the example I gave you from Ohio where you've got this paperwork process that involves all these different parties having to check has you know this step in the uh, 
process happened or not. By consolidating all the information so that, that all the parties that need to be appraised of each change can get, go to a single platform, you can uh, significantly lower the costs of sharing this information. That squeezes out time that is now involves people actually having to exchange the information, and it lowers the cost of the business. Okay, so let's go to the next slide. Now, I want to return to crypto uh, currencies, and uh, the issues with crypto would require their own full speech and analysis. If you haven't seen it already, I want to strongly recommend the recent speech by my colleague on the Financial Policy Committee, John Cunliffe. Sir John offered a comprehensive and deep analysis of many of these issues, and there's a link in the slides there that will be posted after the conference. Uh, but you can just Google John Cunliffe Crypto and you'll, you'll find it. Let me briefly review several of his main points. Um, you can see the speech for the details, and I'll add a couple of additional observations. Now, first, he notes that it's essential to separate those assets that are unbacked, like Bitcoin, from those that are backed. And I'm going I'm going to follow him and call the, the backed ones stable coins. The unbacked ones exhibit extreme volatility. For instance, he notes Bitcoin has seen its price fall by more than 10% on a single day on more than 30 occasions in the last five years. Second point is, today the direct losses to the banks from these extreme price movements would be modest. The banks aren't going to be holding these kinds of assets themselves, so they're not going to suffer balance sheet losses because of that. But third, the larger stability issues come from the way that these unbacked assets are getting attached to the broader financial system. And they're becoming connected so that the banks, through many indirect channels, and the whole financial system through these indirect channels, are potentially uh, sensitive to these movements. So as an example, ownership by leveraged investors has been growing and the exposures of exchanges is increasing. Price con uh, correction in that context could generate knock-on effects through many channels. And these linkages are growing really, really quickly, and so that risk is only going to continue to grow. And then his final point is that the issue with stable coins are very different. It's quite possible that these arrangements will help squeeze the costs out of some payment arrangements. However, as, as Cunliffe notes, they must deliver the same level of safe, safety and assurance as the existing arrangements, and the official sector is taking steps to ensure that's the case. Importantly, some of the major players in this space right now do not meet the standard. For instance, it's often hard to figure out if, if stable coins that claim to be backed are backed and what they're backed with. And this echoes one of the key parts of my framework, that gar garnishing market share by a race to the bottom is not a successful strategy. Now, I agree with all of the points that John made, and my framework also highlights the risks of crypto assets. The value proposition from these assets does not come from one of the issues, uh, from issues related to fixed costs or network effects. And to some extent, they're useful uh, to some actors specifically because they allow people to potentially engage in illegal activity. So I'm skeptical to start with, to the extent they're treated as a new asset class, one has to ask what determines the risk and reward of that class. The possibility that something will rise in value because a greater fool will want to buy it isn't a solid investing philosophy. We know for sure that the large negative uh, price corrections are possible, and if the entire sector re were to reprice downward, it seems plausible to conjecture that this would be more likely during a time of stress when other asset prices are also moving down. So it's not clear to me you even get diversification from holding unbacked crypto assets. Now, one sometimes hear claims that, that fiat money is irresponsibly managed by central banks, and these assets are a good alternative. With inflation running uh, higher than it's been in a while, you're going to hear a lot of that. But that argument runs into two problems. First, precisely because governments control fiat money, governments can accept uh, payment in that fiat money for taxes. That's not true for crypto. The ability of the state to make uh, that decision creates a fundamental demand for fiat money that's missing for crypto assets. Second, even if one cryptocurrency, such as Bitcoin, is in finite supply, there are scores of other cryptocurrencies that exist alongside 
And since each of these assets are unmacked, it's difficult to see why one is so much more appealing than the other. I don't know if this has got made news in, uh, in Europe, but last night it was announced that the Los Angeles Lakers, an iconic NBA basketball team, for the next 20 years, starting on Christmas Day, will be playing in an arena that's going to be renamed Crypto.com. I think it's it's uh, instructive to remember that Enron also named a baseball field before it went under. So for all these reasons, I think unbacked crypto assets uh, do not have a bright future. Okay, let me go to the next slide. Um, I want to uh, close by by thinking about why this framework might be useful for for thinking about financial stability. So so here are a few observations about why approaching things the way I have uh, could be valuable. So first and most importantly, it's useful to start the evaluation of new services and innovations uh, by trying to see what this framework says is the use case for them. Cost-benefit analysis is central to stability regulation, and trying to understand the drivers of change is an obvious first step. When there are high benefits to an innovation, it's appropriate to account for that, deciding how much risk we might accept. Second, when the use case is fundamentally about a race to the bottom and the avoidance of protections that exist in the current system, regulators need to be especially vigilant. Put differently, when it's difficult to deduce the value proposition from an innovation, skepticism should be warranted. Third, this perspective can help identify areas where change may be on the way. Keeping up with the pace of change in the financial system is a difficult task. If this approach can allow the regulators to be monitoring areas that are likely to evolve, that can be valuable. Their time is scarce, so anticipating changes allows regulators to make sure that as the tradition occurs, the appropriate safeguards are in place so that no new systemic risks emerge. Now, the, the second part of the figure that's uh, in my speech shows a second rendering of the payment chain. So, Here's the way that the payment system has actually innovated, and, and you could see that despite there being these five clear links in the system, only two of them right now are actually regulated. Now, in this case, the, the authorities have noticed this and are consulting on how best to proceed. Because the financial system's dynamic, Keeping up with the evolution of risk and the emergence of new critical nodes in the financial system is one of the biggest challenges regulators face. Let me go to the last slide. Um, the, uh, on a forward-looking basis, uh, I suspect that these models of cash flow-based lending are going to come to dominate parts of the market. Now, that business model would likely exhibit substantial post-cyclicality meaning that when times are good, credit extension will be generous, and when times are bad, terms will tighten. And, you know, this would be appropriate if we think just about the risk to the lender of extending the credit. For the borrowers, however, this could lead to substantial amplification of cycles, and thinking about this kind of change in advance would be prudent for stability regulators. Finally, we might want to think a little bit differently about innovation alters fixed costs relative to those that change the na nature of network connections. In very abstract terms, one might expect reductions in fixed costs to promote entry and perhaps increase competition. Whenever network effects or other forces that economists call increasing returns to scale um, make, uh, are present, that's going to make markets more concentrated. Concentration can often come with stability risks if a single entity or a small group of firms become dominant providers of an essential service. If the innovations allow new providers to challenge an existing network, that can be good, especially if it lowers costs. It can, however, also create new risks that need to be monitored. All right, so let me wrap up. I hope that by honing on the forces that drive innovation and disruption, regulators can do a better job of safeguarding the financial system. In the meantime, don't get your investment advice from cab drivers. Thanks for your attention, and I'd be happy to take some questions.